It is declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega, Christus Prentocrator, Christ the King of the Universe. Hymn 365. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you. No secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, 
and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 93. We'll read it in unison. The Lord is king. He has put on splendid apparel. The Lord has put on his apparel and girded himself with strength. He has made the whole world so sure that it cannot be moved. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. You are from everlasting. The waters have lifted up, O Lord. The waters have lifted up their voice. The waters have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the sound of many waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. Mightier is the Lord who dwells on high. Your testimonies are very sure and holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever and forevermore. Today's second reading is from the book of Revelation. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yea, amen, let all adore thee high on thy eternal throne. Savior, take the power and glory. Claim the kingdom for thy own. Beautiful hymn. Beautiful, hard to sing. <laughs> hard to sing. Why is that? The language is wonderful. And for, for many of you, you might know this tune from another hymn, or you might know it from this one. Beautiful tune, beautiful words, and yet hard to sing. And you know what happens to us when we find something hard to sing, right? We don't sing. And we may not even hum if we get a little frustrated. If you're not frustrated and you want to join in, you'll hmm, 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 along with it. But if you are frustrated at what you're trying to do and unable to do it, you won't even do that. You do this other thing where you look down and you look around. Make sure that you're not the only one who's not doing that. What an unexpected example of our life and how we live it in relationship to the event, the celebration of Christ the King Sunday. Here we are on Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday after Pentecost. Next week begins what? Ta-da! Advent, which is the season of what? Christmas. It's the anticipation of the coming of the Christ child. This reflection before the actual birth, the white season again. Remember, it's going to turn color for us now. It's going to be that beautiful royal blue that we have here for the Advent season. And it is a time that we reflect on the coming of the Christ child, the Christ King, the small child King who's going to lead the world into a new kingdom and a new era and a new age and a new possibility and a new, 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 new. And isn't that what a babe does all the time? When a baby enters anyone's life, for good or for ill, that child will change everything. And the good and the ill, by the way, is often completely subjective by the people who are caring for them. If I value my, auton my autonomy and my ability to do what I darn well please when I darn well please it, then a child coming into my life is not a good thing. And I will treat that child in a way that, that predisposes the kid to not be a good thing. I will help that child act out and be difficult and a problem because I will example that to the child. Verse is, is, is exactly true. If a child comes into my life and I'm dying to give up my autonomy, at least in this part, because I'm giving it over, I am sacrificing my life, sacrificing my time, sacrificing my energy. Does this sound like anybody we know to this child? That I will teach the child to sacrifice themselves for others and hopefully in the name of love. So this is coming. This is Advent. This is our reflection in Advent. The reflection in Advent that we're going to get into is not just about anticipation of the coming of Christ, the King, the child who's going to change the world, but how recognizing the ability of that child to change everything, how can I be changed in this moment? And we don't have to wait till the end of the season to change. In fact, that'd be a fool's endeavor, wouldn't it? Storing up all the changes I'm supposed to undertake until the last day. You know how that works when you wait to the last day to study for the test, right? Your grade usually reflects that much or that lack of energy. So here we are, Christ the King Sunday, at the end of a season, at the end of a liturgical calendar and starting a new one. This is, in effect, for us, the end of the year. The first Sunday in Advent is to Christians who follow the liturgical calendar, Happy New Year. It's going to be the first day of the new year. How did we get here? What is this thing all about? Look, 
liturgical calendars, the liturgy has been with us forever, right? The lectionary, rather. The lectionary has been with us forever. Moses had a lectionary. The people of Israel had lectionaries. They came with the Talmud and the Misha formed two forms, two posts of the lectionary. And what these are is they are gifts of the scripture, gifts from God to individuals to say, we need to celebrate because God has called us to this moment to celebrate this thing, this significant event in our life. Oh, I don't know, let's say Passover. Passover is a pretty darn significant moment in the life of the Jewish people and in the life of the Christian people as well because Jesus was in the upper room celebrating the Passover feast, which he then completed by transforming it into what we understand as the Eucharist, the sacrifice that Christ was making on the cross, the sacrifice that he was making of his life, was exampled in the giving of the bread and the wine at the end of the Passover feast. So what is the celebration of the Passover for, for the Jews, or for us for that matter? It is looking back at a significant, important time and marking that time by a lectionary recitation or a liturgical event. I'm going to remember a time when my people, when our people, were slaves, completely withheld from freedom of any kind, subject to anything and everything without any recourse whatsoever. And I'm going to look back and I'm going to contemplate that in my own life and give thanks to God for God's intervention within the context of the life of these people. And I'm going to mark that by reading the scriptures about that event. And then by celebrating it in my own life for the gifts that I've been given, because I've never experienced that, but I have to understand it and appreciate it. These liturgical events, these lectionary events are extremely important, but they can become problematic, right? What if I pay too much attention to the singular event? What if a single event within the context of a lectionary or a liturgical observance becomes so primary in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, that it defines all other events? There is truth in that event, and in truth in every of the other events. But one truth is not subjective to the other, it is a part of the constituent whole. So the lectionary was changed over time. It was added to both in the Old Testament as new, new feasts came along, the Feasts of Booths. Remember that one? That's when Jesus goes up the mountain, Transfiguration, and Peter says, oh, Lord, this is wonderful. Let's make three booths, one for you, one for Elijah. Remember this? One for Moses. So that's the Feast of Booths. It's another lectionary liturgical event. He missed the point of the Transfiguration, thinking of the celebration of an individual lectionary moment. You see how this can happen? Jesus said, nah, yeah, you got this wrong. So this has changed over time. In the New Testament, by the third century, there was a full-blown Christian lectionary. By the time of Augustine, this was going on. Augustine said, you know, to fully understand and comprehend the Old Testament, what God has done in the prediction of God's own presence in your life and my life, the only way to actually read that and get it into focus is to read it through the lens of the New Testament. The lens of the New Testament will focus the intention of the old. So this this lectionary was breathed out even farther. And up into 325, Constantine became emperor of the world. First Christian emperor of the world. And he said, what we need to do, because there's Christians all over the place, and we don't know each other. There's no internet back then, you know. So we don't know each other. Actually, that's probably a good thing, huh? <laughs> we need to get the whole world together. All of the authority in the church needs to come together. So they all went to Nicaea on the, on the emperor's gathering. And every, you know, everybody was happy to do that. They're like, oh boy, road trip. We're going to get to meet people. Let's go. So they get to Nicaea and they hashed out all sorts of church problems, all sorts of world problems. In fact, we're going to say a creed, right? What's that called? Nicene Creed. It's actually the Nicene Constantinopian Creed because it was made partly in Nicaea and then partly later on in Constantinople and put together into one creed. But saying, let's all stand and say the Nicene Constantinopian Creed every Sunday is too long. So we just say the Nicene Creed. So this happened, but there's something else that happened too. The formal lectionary of the Western church was adopted in its original form at the Council of Nicaea in 325. That's the bones of our lectionary, the bones of what we read every Sunday. Now, this was added to over years as we understood that we need to know more. So we are in the revised common lectionary, where several years ago, I think it's probably 10 or 12 now, what it did was just add another track of, 
of lessons of scripture that we can choose to take the original track, the common lectionary, the one that everybody knew with, I grew up on when I was a kid, it's been the same, or the revised common lectionary, the same but different, right? So if you know Kings and Chronicles, they kind of mirror each other. So for instance, in right track one and track two, you'll have Kings, but in track two, you'll have Chronicles. So it's the same, same period, same message, but it's just different. So this has changed even since then. This is the common lectionary that is shared among the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and many other um, judicatories, other denominations that follow the traditional lectionary. We are even looking at changing it and putting in a new track, track three, coming up in the next three and five years. So Christ the King Sunday is a relatively new celebration within the context of a lectionary. This was added by Pope Pius XI in, one, in, in uh, 1925. Why? And how? How did that get so important to us when it was added in 1925? Can anything good come out of 1925? Well, think about what was happening in 1925. This was three years after the end of World War I. World War I, first time in history anybody had said World War and World anything. This is a time when you didn't have a little fight, a little skirmish between these little people country and this little people country. This is when whole countries, whole nations came together and fought each other in the most horrific, horrific and horrible ways. If you do not know the horror of World War I, which is probably unrepeatable in human history from this point forward and compares with the horror of any war at any time and surpasses many, you need to do some history reading. The, what went on World War I, just it devastated generations in their minds and their thoughts. Of course, then they had to contend with World War II. Whoever thought there'd be a World War II. So World War I was started, Pope Pius had, had ended, and Pope Pius looked around and he said, we have, we've come out of this horrible thing. We've, we've learned, we've grown, we're wounded, we're healing, and we're going to get better. Nope. So three years later, Pope Pius is looking around saying, we're not getting better. We're not, we haven't learned. We haven't, we're not doing any better. We are the same. What is wrong that we're the same? Oh, wait, look, a king, a king, a king, a queen, a king, a king. This is a time when the world was populated by royalty. In fact, you probably know that World War I was started by royalty. Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. Who was Archduke Ferdinand? He was an archduke in Austria. He was also heir apparent to the throne. He was the king, basically. Within that year, he probably would have been crowned king. So he was assassinated. And the world went to war over the murder of the king. You know what life is like for the king, don't you? No, how can we know that? Actually, we can know that. We do know that because it just amounts to hero worship with a little bit of, of a national pride thrown in. We have presidents. We have congressmen and senators, we have mayors and governors, and it's just as easy for us to worship those people as it is for anybody to worship a king. What we basically have is that the individual, whether they are a king or a president, they are an individual who, who puts forth a vision for the country that we have pride in because, well, it's our country. And then we throw our weight behind that person in the democratic or in a Republican society, we throw our weight behind that person because they have the vision that we have and we have something in common. We want that vision to come true. But going that far and doing that, we risk a problem, a problem that we are having in the United States right now, which is going to be with us for a while longer. And that is, I throw so much of my weight behind that person, I'm not willing to hear the weight that any other person has, the vision that any other person has, the ideas that any other person has. In fact, I write off the other person as fast as I possibly can. I won't even listen. Why would I? I've got my own king. Uh, sorry, president. I don't need to listen to anybody else. But can one king be right about all things? Gosh, sorry, president. No, of course not. Nobody can. But what Pope Pius saw was that people looked around and imbued within their kings, their royalty, this absolutism with the knowledge and knowing of all things, to do all things, to be all things to all people. And that vision was then carried on and acted on by the country. And that had not changed after World War I. And so Pope Pius said, not only have we not learned, but it's getting worse. And I fear that if we go to war again, it will be a world war of greater proportions than the one we just went through. 
And so we need to refocus how we think about our lives, refocus how we think about our loyalty, refocus how we think about how we give ourselves over to the vision of somebody else and abdicate our own ability to understand or to look deeper into why and how we believe what we believe. I just got a 2016 GMC truck. You probably noticed it's out there. It's the best truck in the whole world. I'm sorry for all you people that have other vehicles. If you had the one that I've got, well, you'd just be better. <laughs> My opinion is great, and I can have it, but to make that determination for everyone else is, well, it's got another name. Oh, it's got a lot of names. I can't say that name. Wait a minute. A little narcissistic, a little arrogant, a little wacky. How can I as an individual, and I'm not talking about kings and princes and presidents and congressmen and mayors now, how can I as an individual make a determination for you? We're talking about this in the class this morning. How can I make a determination with you? You have your own life experience and you have to come to a determination on your own. However, that does not abdicate myself or you from the, uh, the need to dialogue and talk and come together and understand each other's experiences. So you drive a Ford? What makes my GM better than your Ford? Maybe I should listen to what you have to say and understand what your vehicle does and weigh the difference between the two. It may come down that I just like the shape of mine better than the shape of yours. I might drive a lemon because I like the shape so good. But that's not the point. It's listening and understanding, and being humble. And Pius said, in order to, to cultivate this within ourselves, we have to get away from worshiping the, uh, the king. We have to get away from worshiping the individual within our culture and our society, whoever they might be. We have to get back to understanding whose we belong, whom, to whom we belong, to whose we are. We belong to God. We belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is the one who was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is the ruler of all creation. On the cover of your bulletin, you'll see this. This I point this out every few years. The, the Christos Pentocrator, right? So this is not just Christ the King Sunday. This is, this is the official title. This is Christ the King of the Universe Sunday. And this image right here is the image of the relief behind the high altar at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., our cathedral. It's unlike any other relief. It's not a giant crucifix. It's not a whole bunch of other, and you can see, you can't really tell, but it's not too far off around the edge where it's darker. The whole Reredos is darker. This is a lighter stone, and it's a relief that's made in a different type than all the other reliefs. And what Jesus is holding in his hand is not, to much, much people's thought, the world. It is the universe. How many wars have been fought and, fought and skirmishes had because there was a whole little group of people that, that pledged their allegiance to the Duke? And then they were approached by an envoy of the king. And the king said, you need to take your army and go over there. And they said, no, we don't listen to you. We, we, we listen to the Duke. He said, the Duke? The Duke is, let me think, a Duke. We're from the king. The king only, the duke only does what the duke does because the king allows the duke to do it. You have misplaced your loyalty. You need to get on the right team. You need to trade up. And our history is riddled with these little wars and these little problems, these little horrors, and even the assassinations of, oh, I don't know, dukes and the creation of huge wars because the people won't trade up. They will just insist that their GMC is the best in the whole world and nobody else is any good. Pius said, no, let's get back to the scripture. Let's start looking back in the scripture that talks about God, the God who created all things, made all things, sustains all things. Let's talk about God who has the plan to correct all things and bring all things back. Let's talk about the God that made each individual person out of sheer and absolute unadulterated love and loved so much at the changing of the world because of the creation of that one baby, that would be you, that God died so that you would live. This is our king. He's wonderful. 
images and metaphors from scripture. You gotta love it, right? The things that are said about, uh, about life as we move. His clothing was white as snow, hair like hair of pure wool, throne of fiery flames, wheels were burning fire, steam fire, stream of fire issued, uh, issued and flowed out from his presence. Thousands and thousands of served. This is the apocalyptic imagery from Daniel that heralded in the third lesson or the second lesson, which is from the book of Revelation. You know, this type of imagery is hard to get our head around. In fact, people I have talked to in Bible study have dismissed it, not Bible study here, thank Lord, have dismissed this. Oh, this is just silly. But what it is, it is language that fails us. Right? We don't have language that can tell us and show us the image of God. God is just too much for that. So we pick the imagery that would give us a sense of power and majesty and authority. What earthly king do you know that could ride around in a car that's on fire? Can't happen. How about riding around in a car with flames flying out from the side? Can't happen. So what we are hearing in this vision is God saying, don't lose track of the grander, greater. Don't lose track. Don't trade down, trade up. This is the God who created all other things. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. The imagery is supposed to call us back to this place of almost unbelief. How can I believe in this? It's so fantastic. It's so incredible. And of course, faith now comes in because I'm not called to believe alone. I am called to believe in concert with the king. I am not left as a peasant living on the outside of town, fishing in a little stream that doesn't have any fish in it, eating mud wobbles. The king is with me all the time. Christ said, I am with you even until the end of the age and beyond. I am with you because I live for you. I died for you and I lived again for you. I lift you up when you fall. I sustain you when you are in pain. I will make you whole when you feel like you are broken. You are not alone. You cannot be alone. I'm not an absent king. I'm not someone who has gone away and won't come back. We used to call him the, the clockwork God. This is a, a, a genuine theological belief that, belief that so many people have. It's that God created the universe and like a like a cock, you know, a beautiful clock, very intricate, set it to go, put it on a shelf, and then went fishing. He's out golfing. He's gone. And it's just clicking away over there. God's not involved. I don't know where this comes from. You don't hear this in any page of scripture. You don't hear God leaving and the people and saying, I'm just out of here. Now you guys take care of it. It's the opposite. God is with us always. God is attendant to us always. God is with you always. God is offering God's self to you always. There is a very very vivid theological reflection that says in your daily life, God dies theologically, spiritually dies and rises again every day. Every sin, every brokenness, every heartache, every pain, God is giving self, God self up. Christ is dying again in this moment, the sacrifice for you in your pain, in your heartache, in your grief, in your trouble. Christ is offering Christ self up again for you, the King for you, so that you may be made whole, so that you may see and understand this, so that you may grow and become. My kingdom is not of this world, he told Pilate. You know, this is a misunderstood little bit of scripture. I'll give this to you before we end. He says, what have you done? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were from this world, my followers would stop you all from doing it. And this is implying, he's saying, my kingdom. Did you get that? Pilate says, what have you done? He says, my kingdom. So Pilate is prompted. Oh, he says, so you're a king, are you? The mistake that is often made when this scripture is read is that people then hear this next one. So you are a king, says Pilate, and Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. What a political answer, right? You ask a politician, were you there on Tuesday? And he goes, oh, yeah. you said I was there on Tuesday. It's that I don't want to say I was, but I don't want to say I was an answer so I don't get caught by somebody. Very political, very cheesy, cowardly answer, right? What's that old phrase? If you don't stand in for something, you don't fall for everything. Politicians. Oh, I'm sorry, kings. Gosh, I keep getting these. Sorry. This is actually a Greek, a common Greek response. And it is like this kind of response, right? So, so Chester says, Chester go walks into the, to the, uh, the shop, he's taking his car in. There's a guy walking to him. He's, all, he's wearing overalls. He's got greasy hands. He's wiping his hands off. 
And Chester says, you the mechanic? And he said, you say so. Of course he's the mechanic, he's agreeing. Yeah, I'm the mechanic, what do, you, what do you think? I'm the mechanic. This is the kind of answer it is. He's saying, so you are a king. Jesus is saying, yes, I am a king. And we know that's what he's saying because he follows it up with this. You say I'm a king. For this reason I was born, to came into the world to testify to the truth. This is my role, this is who I am as the king. All who hear my voice belong to the truth, and the truth is in them, because they hear my voice. What Jesus is telling us is that we will not find this king here. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, this is the reason I came into this world to do this thing, and it is to lead everybody else out of it. That doesn't mean the world is bad and evil and awful, but it means bad things happen here, and awful things happen here, and things go on here that nobody wants to go on here, and there must be a way that we can ascend or transcend these bad things, even in the life that we live. And Jesus, the truth, the truth, the truth, me, the truth I give to you. You hear my voice, you know the truth. And the truth will what? Set you free. Not set you free from this earthly life when you die and go to heaven. That will happen. But set you free right now, because if you hear that the truth will set you free right now and you stay as you are, then it's worthless. It's worthless. It has no effect. You might as well not read it. It might as well not be written. Jesus is making this promise for you right now. The truth will set you free right now to live a life that is not a life of slavery and bondage. Don't worship these individual events of your life. The Passover was an individual event. The truth of the Passover is a truth that defines life, but it doesn't define all of life. It defines life in its truth with every other feast, every other lectionary moment, every other liturgical celebration that comes along. And you add all these together and you'll get the big picture. The big picture will show you the world, will show you yourself, and will show you the king. The little picture will show you what? The little picture. You define your life by the little picture. That's all you got. A little life and a little picture. So Pius said, we have got to break this. We have got to break this wide open. No president, no king, no duke, no earl, no mayor, no CEO can hold our allegiance, hold our hearts, keep our mind, enslave us. All the truths of the presentation of God, the revelation of Jesus Christ, all the truths of the gift of the King, all the reigning truths of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, define who we are, and it is to Him and only to Him that we give our allegiance, and through Him we find true life as the truth lives within us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, he said, from the beginning to the end and beyond. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Constantinopian Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus for the world, the church, and one another. Gracious Father, you have made your son king of creation and head of your holy church. Bind that church to Christ with cords of love. Make it unswerving in faith, radiant in holiness, and bold in witness to him. Use it to draw all people to his cross, there to acclaim him as Lord, King, and Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have made your son fairer than the sparkling stars on high. Let the light of his love bring joy to the hearts of all Christians who suffer because they name Jesus as Lord. And may that same light illumine and cleanse the darkness in the hearts of their tormentors. Help us to remember them in prayer, to stand with them in witness, and to provide tangible help for their physical needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have made your son our Savior and Lord. Fill the people of this congregation with your Holy Spirit, so that in all we say and do, among all people we encounter, we acclaim Jesus Christ as Son of God and Son of Man. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have made your sun fairer than sunlight and moonlight, sparkling stars, or the radiant beauty of this good earth. Give to all who love the beauties of this created realm a deep and everlasting love for the uncreated light and supernal beauty of your Son, the word by which all worlds were made. Lord, in your mercy, here. You have made your Son Lord of the nations. By your Holy Spirit, conform the hearts of rulers and people to the heart of Christ. Let his peace reign undisturbed in every land. Lord, in your mercy, you have made your son our light, joy, and crown. Grant that his strong, saving love might accompany those who serve our country here and abroad. Fill them with honor, courage, and wisdom. Bring them home in safety when their task is done. Heal and strengthen all who have been wounded and help them to transition well into civilian life. Lord, in your mercy, you have made your son fairer than woodlands, meadows, and flowers of blooming spring. Let his beauty, healing, and compassion cause all sorrowing hearts to sing. Especially this day, we pray for the needs of those on our prayer list for Horace, Chester, Jean, for Sharon and Jay, for Sue, for Melanie, Kaylin, for Darian and Vanessa, for Bob, for Thomas, for Steve and me, for Lori and Mike, for Marion and Chester, for Bob, and for Doris. And our extended family, Paige, Byron, the Lindsay family, Tyler, Sadie, Gary, Peggy, Mitch, Sarah, Glenn, Cameron, Autumn, Dave and Jay, Myron and Shirley, Grinnell, Mary Lou, Anne, Sam, Natalie, Bridget, Betty, Jeff, Betty, Chuck and Georgiana, Barbara, JB and his family, Ter and Terry. Lord, in your mercy. Most gracious Father, you have made your son to shine more brightly than the angels of heaven itself. We thank you for the lives of the faithful departed, including those who already see his glory face to face. Fill us with such faith and love that in your good time, we shall join them in singing glory and honor, praise and adoration now and forevermore be thine. Lord, in your mercy. 
For Jesus' sake, dear Father, graciously hear and generously answer our fervent petitions to your glory and for the benefit of those for whom we pray. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Give us our worship and devotion to the things of our lives. Help us and heal our souls that we would acknowledge you as God alone and Jesus as the only one worthy of our worship. Purify us, Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, the King, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Good morning. Great, wonderful, fantastic to be with you here this morning. Very crisp day. And listen, folks at home, so I'm sorry about the bulletin. I know your bulletin does not match the bulletin that we have here. Much, much apologies. So I guess in those moments like prayer, you're just like hunkering down, getting with the rhythm and staying in prayer. So kudos to you. Good job. Uh, some announcements here in the bull. The insert is the same though. So you've got the insert. You can follow along with that as, as well as the lesson. So I've got the, the insert here. Some of you may have that. If not, then you're doing it all from, the, from this. I, I, you should have this though. So there are a whole bunch of announcements here. Hope that you can go through them. There is a, an addition. The first Sunday fellowship that is meeting on December 4th is now going to be at the house of Sandy Wainwright. So uh, look forward to that. If you have questions about what that is, or you'd like to join or you'd like to attend, I don't know if there's join, you'll join, just you attend. Um, you can contact Sandy or Jenny or probably just grab somebody and ask them and, and go from there. I understand it's a pretty low key, low impact event. So no dangers whatsoever. I'm just invited to go. Men's night out is going to be concurrent with women's ladies night out. And we're going to, let me see, enjoyable details to come. So we're going to figure out where we're going to go. We just go to a local restaurant and tie a few, I mean, no, no, no. We have a little something to eat. Uh, have a little something to eat. Last time we went to, where was it? We went to uh, Don Quixote's. No, Don. Is it say the fifth? Okay, but it's the fifth. Okay, so it's the fourth. Don, Don Pedro's. We went to Don Pedro's over on 301. So we changed it up. We went to Panera before that. So if you want to come, come on board. We'll let you know where it's going to be. Just show up. Easy, easy. Lots of other stuff, so please read it over and look at it and, and uh, plug yourself in where it is needed. I will tell you that the Wednesday night fellowship, which took a hiatus for a couple of months, uh, did that in the, with the intention of gathering together again on Wednesday nights in Advent because we have a Wednesday night Advent program. So that will be coming out in Creator Calling in the next several weeks. You will see an invitation, and then in Creator Calling, there'll be an invitation for you to attend that on Wednesday nights, a Zoom meeting, and it's going to be just a Compline and about a half an hour, 45-minute uh, Advent program uh, to, to be a part of during the weeks of Advent leading up into Christmas. So look for details about that coming out for Wednesday nights in Advent. Other announcements? Stu. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you to everybody, especially the Lutherans who are not here today, but they are essential to this uh, operation. Uh, everybody that helps is essential. If you can't do it, come on. And obviously, thanks to Robert for continuing his group to mentor our team master. So, uh, just wanted to say thanks. Yeah. 
not, not a surprising omission in Catherine's thanks uh, based on her humility is the work that she does and the um, organizational skill and the energy and the dedication to making this happen. So much thanks to you, Catherine, for your, your gifts and your service to the parish in doing this. Very fantastic. It turned out great. It was a great event. Lots of people there, lots of, lots of talking and going on at 4.30 in the morning and lots of good times were had by all, even later on in the day. As, uh, as they barreled into to letting the, the courts go as the people came. So great times. If you didn't do it this year, look for next year. It's, it's always great. It's always terrific. Sounds like it's like, oh my gosh, a drudge, but it's not. It's not. It's a lot of fun. Time to be together. Others. Ah, next week, first week of Advent and an unusual event for me. I haven't done this in a long time, but I am going away for Thanksgiving and I'm going to be away for Thanksgiving. So next week uh 10 30 service is morning prayer so somebody and this is eight o'clock too so eight o'clock i said this eight o'clock and then <laughs> we're going out the door and people said oh oh just, i have a can't wait and then I'm, there's no church next week so i won't be coming back you know, it's not, like i didn't say that i didn't say there's no church next week i said it's morning prayer so please come back to church and go to morning prayer it'll be led by a lay person there are beautiful services of morning prayer it's tradition of our faith you know, the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, the colonial Episcopal Church, would not be the Episcopal Church except for morning prayer. When there were no clergy because you had the Anglican priests that left and went back to England because we were fighting a little, little dispute with them, remember? So a lot of them went back and there weren't any clergy here. The Episcopalians or the Anglicans in the United States or the colonies at the time, then the United States said, we don't want to give up being Anglican. We don't want to give up being Episcopalian. We want this. This is our heritage. This is our life. How can we stay this and not violate our own polity because we can't celebrate without a priest? And they adopted the, what's called choir offices that are done in monasteries and are done all over the world and still done every day. Choir offices are everyday events in monasteries. And it became the staple for Sundays until they could get a full-time or, or a circuit priest to come through and do communion. And that was morning prayer. So this is a regular part of our liturgical life, our electionary life to have morning prayer services. So look forward to morning prayer at eight o'clock and 10.30 next week, and then back to the regular services for the remainder of Advent. Birthdays. Anniversaries. Okay, to everybody who you are and when's your anniversary? Give up anniversary is tomorrow. And, and you want to share how many? It's like four years? 53. 50, I was close. 53, outstanding, wonderful. All right, you can stand or kneel, it's up to you. You stand, do you mind if I kneel? Sorry. Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this gift of life and this gift of place and this gift of time. You've called us to be your children and to learn and to grow in our understanding of your kingship, your lordship, your gift of life and laughter and joy. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you have and continue to do for us. And that, that so includes the, the fellowship of your servants Jim and Lynn with us in this walk along the way. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to bless them in heart and body and mind. Raise them up in their spirit that they might seek you and find you and experience your joy and love and, and gift in companionship. We ask you to fill their hearts with, with wonder and with love for the things that you have made and to see through those things the beauty of your countenance and your presence as you accompany them. We ask you to make them strong in, in body, in their service, and in their witness, and to continue to raise them up as powerful witnesses of your love in the world, that they may proclaim your lordship and your love to others, that they might find you. And then to, you would continue to empower them here in their service and ministry as our companions along the way, that we might be, continue to be inspired by their love and by their companionship and by their service in your most holy name. Holy Trinity, we ask your blessing upon them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Yay, happy anniversary.
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, our King of kings and Lord of lords, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, 
to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespass. We forgive those who trespass against us. And not but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of 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 Christ, the bread of heaven. Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. 
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Let us pray. Lord God of the harvest, with joy we have offered thanksgiving for your love in creation and have shared in the bread and wine of the kingdom. By your grace, plant within us a reverence for all that you give us and make us generous and wise stewards of the good things we enjoy. Through Jesus Christ the King, our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
Alleluia. Let us go forth into the world in the name of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.